A couple of months ago, I narrated two stories by tonight's fantastic author. They went down particularly well among you all, and so I have decided to return to his work. Tonight I do something a little different. I'm bringing you a collection of very, very short stories, each with their own nasty little kick. So, you know what to do. Sit back and relax with your favourite drink. Because it's time to listen. After a long day of work, there was nothing I wanted more than a nice, relaxing shower. Under the rivulets of water, I felt the stress and tension wash off me. I stepped out of the shower, silently cursing that it was laundry day, and I had no clean towels to dry off with. It wasn't really a big deal. I would drip dry and make sure that I took everything to the laundry the next day. I walked around the bedroom, letting the cool night air circulate over my body which caused my skin to prickle. It was cold outside, but I expected the house should have been a little warmer. I would have to call the utilities and see if there might be a problem with my heating. I didn't want to sit on anything for fear of soaking it, so I decided I would lay out my clothes for the next day. I stepped into my closet and pulled the cord to turn on the light bulb that hung from the ceiling. There was a brief flash before something was illuminated that I had not prepared for. A man. In one fist, he clenched an old-fashioned straight razor. In his other hand was a roll of electrical tape and a bag of salt. There was a twisted smile plastered across his face that made his intentions very clear. I wanted to scream, but fear paralyzed my throat. I don't know what was scarier. The realization that I was in this situation stark naked. Or the fact that he was too. To tell you the truth, I needed to drink. I would have a hard day at work, and I would go to the bar and let the alcohol wash away my thoughts. It was cathartic. My daughter, wife, and friends would always lay into me when I got home for stinking of alcohol. They would bitch at me saying that I just wasn't the person they thought I was when I went out drinking, and I could be such a better person. They would always be lying in wait for me when I got home. I would walk through the door and find a group of my family and friends waiting for me. They would always ambush me with prepared letters about how my drinking made them feel, which of course was always bullshit as they didn't give me an appropriate time to form my argument to theirs. There wasn't much I could do under their relentless assault. I'd always let them cry and rage against me. Afterwards, I would tell them I would change and find the strength to quit. <laughs> a few weeks later, I would down a fifth of Jack Daniels and wash away my thoughts and the process would begin again. They would organize another meeting and I would keep making empty promises because I knew it was better than the alternative. When I was sober, I'd keep imagining them on hooks, pleading and begging for sweet release. I'd imagine their flesh and how it would be so appealing to slice open, tear apart. 
They want me to keep drinking. But without it, I keep imagining the end. I'd imagine how they would plead, and how they would taste. I think this last intervention really stuck. Oh, I feel like myself again. The entire crew gathered around the window. This time it wasn't to stare into the infinite blackness of space, or ponder the nature of their exploration. They weren't looking out. Instead, they were looking down. Down at mankind, finally reaping what they had sown. Detonations that were visible from space dotted the earth. The explosion stretched up as if to ensnare heaven itself. The massive mushroom clouds started off in small numbers, but quickly grew as more countries attempted to make their contribution towards their ultimate demise. Soon, the entire world was pockmarked with massive radioactive mushroom clouds. A few hours later, there was nothing, and no one, left. The astronauts could only watch in a dumbfounded mix of terror and shock, as their homes were lost to fallout and scorched Earth policies brought into action decades ago. There was no one else. It was only them now. Music sliced through the tension and terror. Vera Lynn crooned. Keep smiling through. Just like you always do. All it took was one man to start laughing before the entire crew dissolved. Some laughed until their stomachs wrapped themselves into knots. Some laughed until tears welled up in their eyes. Some laughed even though they found nothing particularly funny. They continued to laugh, even though there was no point anymore. And that just made them laugh all the harder. Tonight I came home to the fragrant smell of roses. It only took a few minutes of investigating to find the source of the smell. My bed was covered in a vibrant crimson color that made my heart skip a beat. It was completely hidden under a layer of rose petals. There was a candle on the dresser and its light illuminated the message. I am yours. And you are mine. I love you and I want to do something that will take your breath away. It was a romantic gesture. It would have been more romantic had I not been single for the past three years. It would have been romantic had the message not been written in crimson as well. Now. I can smell that iron odor in every corner of my house, and my heart is beating like it is about to rip out of my chest. I can only wonder what they meant by wanting to do something that would take my breath away. I'd been wandering around this cave for hours. I'd gotten separated from the tour guide and spent the last four hours wandering around in the darkness. I'd started the tour around three, which meant, according to my internal clock, that it was around seven or eight. The sun would be setting, and the forest would become just as dark as it was in the cave. I wandered around in the darkness with my hand on a wall of the cave. I was certain that 
if I stuck to this path, that I would eventually come to the mouth of the cave. After another hour of bumbling around in the darkness, I found my way out. It was a moonless night, but I could see the stars in the sky. I wept with relief as I looked up at those beacons of light. <sighs> there were thousands of them up there. I watched in wonder as they winked out of existence, only to reappear seconds later. I watched this phenomenon in confusion. It took a few seconds for me to come up with my answer. These weren't stars winking and blinking into and out of existence. They were eyes and they were drawing closer to me. Atheists, agnostics and theologists gathered around to debate and quibble over the latest discovery. In the farthest reaches of space, an astronomer had come across a source of pure energy. It resonated on a wavelength that seemed otherworldly. It was far beyond the reaches of human engineering and technology. The astronomer, a devoted believer, wasted no time in gathering up the media and other like-minded scientists and declaring that he had discovered the existence of God, the Creator. Atheists called it the inanimate remnants of the Big Bang. Theologists claimed it was the embodiment of God. Agnostics just shrugged their shoulders when asked and claimed, huh, who knows? After days of debate, someone came up with the idea to try and make contact with the entity that was perched on the edge of the universe to get their answer. They would try blasting a wide array of frequencies, languages, and music at it, in an effort to make contact. They tried everything. Atheists cursed it and tried to invoke its wrath. Theologists tried praying in an effort to make it respond to their supplications. After exhausting all strategies, a young agnostic man stepped up to the podium. He was well respected on all sides and was probably the best educated and well-versed scientist in the group. He addressed the crowd. This is indeed God. We have found the Creator. Atheists were outraged. Theologists were incensed. If this was God, why was it not responding? The agnostic man took a second before saying, It's simple. God is not responding, because God no longer cares about us. <laughs> we made a lot of promises, typically after making love. When we were covered with sweat and spent from our lust, we would whisper sweet nothings. He had his arms wrapped around me, and I could still feel him inside me. He pulled me close, and he said it. Together. Forever. The car slammed into a tree and pitched me forward. He was stopped from joining me by the steering wheel. I rolled through the woods, a whirling dervish of bruises, broken bones, and blood. I passed out, and when I awoke, I was alone. The ambulance must not have seen me and left me behind. I hobbled home, my bones sucking and popping lewdly out of my wound. It took a few days, but I finally reached him. He was heavily medicated. He looked shocked to see me. 
It was my appearance that so profoundly impacted him. My blood had congealed on my mottled grey skin. The wounds where my bones broke through had begun to rot. A day of travelling in the hot sun had already made me bloat up with gases from decomposition, and I looked almost pregnant. I was rotting from the inside out. He was still under the influence of his medication, but that would wear off. I sat down next to him and ran my putrescent and cold hand over his head. He stiffened as I leaned in close. My words rattled through my broken teeth into his ear. Together. Forever. Carrie always loved Sundays. Her parents would go out to run errands, leaving her to call her boyfriend. Her parents didn't know about him. As an only child, her parents were overprotective and prohibited her from dating until she was 15. She, of course, decided to keep Josh's existence hidden from them. This didn't matter. She loved him. She loved talking to him. His voice set her heart to flutter. Sunday was the only time she could call him and not have to be worried about getting caught. It became a ritual for them. Every Sunday she would call and they would talk until her parents got home. There was one blemish in this otherwise perfect scene. Josh's brother was noisy and would always pick up the phone and listen in on their conversation. Carrie could hear his breathing while they talked. He tried to breathe softly, but she could still hear him. This went on for weeks, and slowly Carrie's frustration at the situation grew. Josh ignored it, but after one particularly heated conversation, Carrie asked, Could you tell your brother to buzz off? I can hear him listening on the other phone line. Josh's answer was sobering. We don't have another phone in the house. I thought you said you were certain your parents had gone out to run errands. Carrie listened to the phone click onto the receiver in her kitchen. She had watched her parents leave. Whoever was in the kitchen... It wasn't her parents. Alexei stood on the bridge that overlooked the surrounding area with his mouth agape. He had never seen something so wondrous. Off in the distance glowed an ethereal blue light. It mixed with the dusky twilight and seemed to cast an otherworldly look on the area surrounding it. People from all over the town had flocked to this overlook after hearing the news of this oddity. They all stood, dumbstruck, bathing in the light that emanated from the landscape that was stretched out before them. Alexei fell to tugging on his pant legs, and he looked down to see his youngest, Sergei. He was six years old and couldn't get a look at the radiance. He was begging his father to boost him up so he could get a better view. He obliged with a smile on his face and picked up his son, setting him on his shoulders. The two watched the light, awestruck at the inherent beauty of the world. Alexei knew that if he lived to be one thousand years old, he would not see another sight that rivaled the beauty of the bluish light intermingling in the Pripyat sky. It was April the 26th, 1986, and Chernobyl had suffered a catastrophic failure at its nuclear power plant. Within a month, anyone who went to watch that glow withered away, 
and died from acute radiation poisoning. Johnny was having a tough time readjusting to life after the move. They'd moved after Steve had lost his job. The father knew it was difficult being moved from your home and forced to make new friends in a new school. He'd gone through it himself when he was young, and he empathised. Which was why he decided to do something nice for him. He'd just lost another one of his baby teeth. And Steve sat down with him and explained how he had talked to the Tooth Fairy, and convinced him to increase the price for teeth to five dollars, as Johnny had been such a good boy lately. Johnny's eyes lit up the next morning, when he found five dollars under his bed. He excitedly talked about buying a new Game Boy, so he could play Pokemon with his friends. Steve told him that five dollars would not be enough. He'd meant to discourage him. He planned on giving his son a Game Boy in a few months, when his birthday rolled around. Johnny stuck out his lips and pouted. It was tough seeing him like that, but he didn't have the money for the system yet. Johnny, however, wanted it now, and he had a plan. Steve woke up to a horrible scene the next morning. Johnny was at the kitchen table, with pliers in his hand. Blood stained his mouth and the front of his shirt. In front of him were six tiny teeth. Steve could only watch in shock, as his son angled the pliers back towards his mouth, and burbled through the blood. Just two more, and I'll have enough. Thanks for taking the time to drop by and watch this video. You know what would make me a happy doctor? Hitting that like button, leaving a comment, and subscribing to my channel. Go on, I've got plenty more stories to tell you. 